Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the last in the series, A Historical Awareness of Race. This program is sponsored by, co-sponsored by the Spirit Council and the Simsbury Public Library. I'm here with my colleague, Lloyd Huey. Um, we would like to, first of all, thank a few important people. Um, Anitra Powers is our camera person, and she's more than a camera person. She's coordinating all of the tech to bring this to you. So thank you, Anitra. Thanks also to Patrick Fallon, who is the assistant manager of SCTV. We couldn't be more excited that we have this new partner uh, going forward. Um, also, very special thanks to the co-heads of the Spirit Council, Cheryl Cook and Nicole Kodak. They are tireless. Without their individual help, this would not have happened. So we would like to begin with the land acknowledgement. We begin by acknowledging that the land that is now the town of Simsbury, on which we gather, is the territory of the Wetog and Masako peoples, who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We further recognize the Wetog Masako people's migration to Salisbury, Connecticut, alongside other Tungsis tribes after Medicom's rebellion. The Wetanuk, Pequot, Putatuk, Tungsis, and Mohican peoples came together along the Housatonic River, creating the contemporary Chattacook Nation. We thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Lloyd Huey. Lloyd. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. And thank you all for joining us. And um, also want to thank you for those of you who've been with us throughout this series. Um, it's been a quite an experience and a privilege to be able to just walk through and share with you all that we have had the opportunity to learn during this session. So for our final session, we will be talking about the origins of wealth and income inequality and the power of proximate, proximity and where do we go from here. Uh, you know, when we talk about, when we started this series, there is so much that we wanted to share, and we've been through a lot, and this has been a walk through history. Um, I know that for many of you, it was a lot of history you had not known about, you, you, some, for, me, for some, it's new things you learned, and for some, it was a question of, what about where we are today? And we've made, as I said last week, we've made progress in a lot of areas for a number of people, but for everyone, that has not been the experience. And so we wanted to walk this journey so we could get to where we are today and talk about how we move forward and help hopefully make things better for everyone. Um, when we talk about wealth and income, and I say wealth, one of the things that we first think about is land, property, stocks and bonds. But when you go back to the founding of this nation, you have to think back to land and property. And if you were able to build and establish land and property centuries, decades, or many years ago, you've had the opportunity to build wealth and also to pass that on to your generations. So I just wanted to, as I was wrapping this up and since we didn't have the opportunity to share all of this and to have the discussions, what I would ask is that outside of this, that you take that opportunity to have those conversations, have discussions with people. Um, but I would encourage you, encourage you to use these same ground rules. In your interaction, feel free to share openly and respectfully, even when you're, what you're sharing is hard truth. Listen and be respectful. It's okay to disagree. 
with something that someone that you're talking to or that, that, that is said here. But when you disagree, don't just be disagreeable, but clearly state what you disagree with and why. One of the big challenges that I would say we have in our society today is that we don't have honest, open, and respectful communications. We get polarized, and because of that, there is no communication going on, just a lot of yelling. And I hope that through this process, we can continue to have those conversations. So when we talk, as I said, when we talk about the origins of wealth and income inequality, we have to go back in time. And when you look at it, you will see that the 1719 Naturalization Act created citizens to immigrants that were free white persons. So if you were a Native American or a person of color, you were not allowed to participate in the 1719 Naturalization Act. You could not benefit from that. Then in 1830, we had the Indian Removal Act. You had the Cherokee Trail of Tears. What did that do? That was essentially a land grab. So for the Native Americans that had property and they did not own, see themselves as possessing the property, their, their, their ownership of property was through the use of those resources. And they believed that it was for the community as a whole and they had the, the privilege to use that property. And so because of the Indian Removal Act, it resulted in them losing access to many of that property and others taking possession of that. Then in 1862, we had the Homestead Act. Over 270 million acres of native lands were redistributed. A part of that redistribution there was supposed to be an exchange where they would, should have been paid for that. And there were treaties that were signed, but unfortunately they were broken. They were never paid and compensated for that land. So what you had happening was they lost property. They lost the ability to maintain and build the wealth they have. And they end up not gaining the payment that they should have received for that. Then in 1882, we had the Chinese Exclusion Act. This restricted Chinese immigration and naturalization. This also was another way of preventing wealth from being built. 1913, we had the Alien Land Law. This reserved farmland for whites, prevented Asian immigrants from owning or leasing land. So what you have here is a process of people being prevented from owning or leasing, owning land or even leasing it, and it being taken and given to others. In 1917, we have the Immigration Act. This was in 1921, we have the Emergency Quota Act. And in 1924, we had the, another Immigration Act, which limited another, a number of Southern and Eastern European immigrants. Um, it did not want, and this was, it's a, it's a, the purpose of this was no one wanted to change the national character of the country. That's a line that we hear a lot in our communities today. We don't want to change the character of our town. And I would say, what does that really mean? How does someone looking like me or someone else moving into the town change the character? So when we say that, let's examine what do we really mean by that and what is that saying about what we believe and who we are? Then came 1929 through 1936 when we deported nearly between 400,000 and 2 million Mexican-Americans back to Mexico. Incidentally, these were people who were born here. 85% were born here. They were citizens. They were building and establishing 
a legacy, building wealth, building communities. And they were taken and thrown out and they lost it all. And because they were deported, others took ownership of their property. Then in 1942, we had the Japanese internment camps. As I mentioned a few weeks ago, what happened was the, the Japanese were told you have so, uh, as little as six days to sell all your property. You had six days to get rid of it and you're gonna take whatever you can carry and you'll be going to these camps. Having, let's think about it, if you had to sell your home, your car, or any of your valued possessions in six days, how would that impact your wealth? If you really think about it, afterwards, many years later, those who were alive, they, they received $20,000 as compensation. But think about how much was lost during that period. And then in 1954 to 1964, we had the McCarran Waters Act. And this was another immigration preferences, preference system. And, you know, land is about wealth net worth and income. And when we look at what has happened through the years, we realize that what ended up happening is that there was a preference given to the white community and those of color, they lost property, they were deported, they were put in internment camp and they were never given that full opportunity to build wealth and to create the income which they, which they were entitled to benefit from. Then we come stepping back between 19, the, between the 1900 and the 1970s, what we had was a lot of immigration, people moving from the South to major cities throughout the US. And this was a time when people wanted to create, to find an opportunity to start making a better life for themselves. Um, when you th look, think of the South and um, the Blacks, African Americans who lived in the South, there was not much of a life. They were dealing with the effects of Jim Crow. They were dealing with um, rampant segregation, limited opportunities. So between 1900 and 1970, almost 7 million African Americans moved from the South to major cities around the, the US. And this was in an effort to create wealth and to create an opportunity to build a better life for themselves. Um, this was during the World War I. This was also part of, during World War I, what we had happening was that you had agents from the North who would go to the South and they would solicit labor, people who would to come to the North to work. Unfortunately, they were promised a lot of things, but when they, many came here, they found out it was not all that was promised. Then between 1900 and 1915, we had over 15 million Eastern and Southern Europeans, most also went to the urban centers, and US population averaged about 75 million at that time. And I think in New York City, it was said that about 75% of the population were people who were coming from other countries. In 1913, we had Woodrow Wilson segregates the federal bureaucracy, and he showed the first film in the White House in 1915, Birth of a Nation. So what this did was basically to reinforce white supremacy, embolden the KKK, and discourage growth for many people. Um, we had World War I, then we had, as I said, the KKK, the rise of the KKK and w white resentment about jobs being taken by black and papist ethnicities. And these were people who were considered Catholic or who were part of the papal system. And they were also discriminated against. So, in 1918, just over 100 years ago, they had a similar experience to what we are having right now, the Spanish flu. And then after the 
Spanish flu, you had the 1919 bloody riots. And not too long after, a few years later, what we ended up having was the 1929 crash. So there was an economic crash. So all of these things stirred up, had, a ne had an impact on people's ability to build wealth. Now, I've talked about what has happened historically, but there's a couple of things that I want to highlight and talk about how the government also created this system and supported this system. So if we go back through slavery, you didn't have opportunities for people of color to go to school, get the education they needed. They couldn't get jobs unless it was not wanted by someone who was white. It was very difficult for people of color to have opportunities to get jobs. In 1934, the government, the government formed the Federal Housing Administration and they started this process of redlining. This was another, and actually it's a very pivotal part of why so many communities in the urban area does not have the wealth that we look around and said, and people will say, why don't they have that? Well, look, a big part of the answer is that the government created a system that created that. Does that mean that it's all the government? Well, no, there are some people who were not willing to work and there were a few who are like that. And so there is that cause, but a big part of that problem was that the government created a system that prevented people from building wealth. So think about it. The, back in 1934, if you wanted to buy a home, you had to come up with 50% of that home value and you had five years to pay that home off. Not a lot of people can own homes under those circumstances. But with the FHA, what happened, the government decided that you only need to put up 5%. 5% versus 50%. And you have 30 years to pay that off. So what ended up happening is people would be paying a lower mortgage than they would be paying for rent. Unfortunately, what the government did, they also said that there are certain communities that we don't want to provide any assistance to. We don't want, if they're people of color or mixed communities, you're gonna be excluded and we're gonna limit it how much you can, how much access you have to the Federal Housing Administration program. So with that happening, going back to 1934, a lot of people were not able to, did not have that opportunity to build and grow their wealth. So think about it. If a family, let's say a black family and a white family living, initially living in the same neighborhood and the white family is able to move to the suburbs, buy this home, when they do that, and, and the black family is not allowed, is not able to because the government would not provide them with the same opportunity because they also pass laws where in some places where you cannot have a mixture where if a community is already all white, you're not allowed to move in as a person of color. And if it's an all black community, a white person is not allowed to move in. But if you're moving, everyone wants to move to a better place. And so what ended up happening is that the white family was able to buy, build, buy their home, build wealth. And over time, this wealth <clears throat> can be passed on to generations. Allow these, the, their, their descendants to go to college, get a good education, <clears throat> pay medical expenses. And so it creates this wealth that you can use to continue to build your family, your descendants, and to grow. In the black community, because that was not available, it was very difficult. Um, there are examples of contract leasing that was done in many cities. Um, name study was done in Chicago where that was um, a big problem. What, because black families did not have access to the FHA, what ended up happening is that a lot of 
white investors would buy property and then they would r sign a contract with a black family too, and they'd have 10 or 20 years to pay that off. But it was not an acquisition. It was not a purchase, home purchase. It was a rent to own. But the problem with that is that if that homeowner missed one payment, if it's a 20 year contract and in year, year 19, 19 years and 10 months in, you miss one payment, you lose that entire investment into that property. And during that time, you're not building any equity. So this was another way that the government created this problem of diminishing the ability for people of color to build and, and to grow wealth. There's a study that was done by Richard Rothstein, and I'm gonna show a video of him in a moment. And he talked in more detail about how the government was very instrumental in this process. And if you listen and read his book, you'll realize what he said is that it, this is not information that is difficult to find or hard to find. It's publicly available information of how the government was instrumental in this. And so with that, if you give me a second, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to this video and I wanna share with you how the government participated in, in this. The New Deal um, was the uh, Federal Housing Administration's um, program to create white subdivisions, white suburbs surrounding central cities across the country. And they uh, uh, built suburbs by guaranteeing loans to mass production builders of suburbs to, uh, uh, on condition that uh, those homes only be sold to white families, that no African-American be permitted to buy homes. So, for example, uh, the best known example perhaps is Levittown, uh, east of New York, uh, east of New York City, where Levitt built 17,000 homes uh, in the late 1940s and early 1950s, uh, uh, which he could never have assembled the capital to build uh, on his own. Uh, instead, uh, the uh, federal government uh, guaranteed bank loans to Levitt to build that, sub that suburb on condition that we sell no homes to African Americans. And in addition, the federal government required that he put a clause in every deed in Levittown uh, that prohibited resale to African Americans. Well, this went on all across the country and the mass suburbanization of the country. Uh, California, the, the, the biggest example of subdivisions built all over California on explicit condition set by the federal government that no homes be sold to African Americans. Uh, once this was done, uh, the civilian housing then became available again. There would have been a big shortage before the 50s because no civilian housing was uh, built during the uh, war uh, uh, because materials, building materials weren't permitted to be used for civilian construction. And there was a big housing backlog even before the war because of the depression. So when civilian housing construction began again in the 1950s and the Federal Housing Administration subsidized whites to uh, move into these all white suburbs, uh, explicitly all white by federal requirement, whites began to abandon the inner cities and abandon the public housing, uh, which had been primarily designed for them before that time. Uh, there was a uh, public housing uh, beginning in the mid 1950s the white projects, and there were many, many more projects for whites at that time than there were for African Americans. White projects began to have large vacancies. Black projects had long waiting lists. And the reason was simply that the federal government was subsidizing whites to leave cities. Well, industry then began to leave cities as well. And uh, so the African Americans who were living in public housing uh, became poorer and poorer. Uh, jobs disappeared. Uh, and uh, African Americans weren't able to gain the wealth that housing ownership created. So these policies resulted in greater poverty of the African American population. And I, and I wanted to ask you specifically about that because this really isn't only about uh, residential segregation. As you just mentioned, it really is about the wealth that government 
policies created for white families that black families did not have access to. So when you look at the racial wealth disparities, the racial wealth gap today, you really trace it to these housing policies that started in the New Deal and that, that continued in the decades after. Can you, can you really give us a picture of that? Sure. Well, uh, let me go back to that example I gave a minute ago of Levittown, uh, in, uh, which is the most famous of these uh, suburbs, uh, these 17,000 homes east of New York City. Those uh, homes sold uh, in the late 1940s and early 1950s for about uh, $8,000, $9,000 a piece. Uh, in today's dollars, that's about $75,000 to $100,000. And as I mentioned, only whites could buy it. There were many, many African Americans who couldn't afford it to build, uh, to buy homes in Levittown. Uh, $100,000 in today's dollars is about twice national median income. Working class families can afford to buy a home at twice national median income, African Americans as well as whites, but African Americans were prohibited. Uh, Instead, African Americans were living in in, uh, cities and renting apartments. Whites were uh, able to buy these homes. Well, today, homes in Levittown sell for $300,000, $400,000. That's seven, eight times national median income. Unaffordable to working class families, to lower middle class families, whether they're white or black. So the white families who were able to buy into these suburbs that were created all over the country by the federal government, the whites only, gained two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars in equity appreciation in the next two generations. African Americans who were forced to uh, only rent apartments because they were not permitted to live in the suburbs gained none of that equity appreciation. In the United States, most wealth of middle-class families is attributable to the equity they have in their homes. So today, nationwide, African-American incomes are about 60% of white incomes. But African-American wealth is only 5% of white wealth on average. And that enormous disparity, the difference between the 60% income ratio and the 5% wealth ratio, is almost entirely attributable to unconstitutional federal housing policy that was practiced in the mid-20th century. It allowed for those veterans who had um, been a part of the war to be able to buy homes, but it also allowed them to send their kids to college. Um, What happened is because of the policy that the, the FHA had, Many cities in town used those same policies and prevented African Americans and people of color from getting the benefit of those loans. And, and, and so what you have was two great systems that were there to help people, Americans build wealth, but it was restricted and people of color were prohibited from be- getting the benefit of that. And as I mentioned earlier, we had the Great Depression, which halted the progress of African-Americans and Americans in general. Um, And then you had the New Deal, which was passed, which directed wealth to white families. There were also restrictions. Then we had the Social Security Act. This was another um, law that was, legislation that was passed. It excluded domestic servants and farm workers. Who were the people who were primarily involved in domestic labor and, and doing farm work? It was primarily people of color. So they worked, but they were not able to get the benefits of that. Um, so these were things that continued to impact and limit the ability of African-Americans to build and grow wealth. Um, then we had the Wagner Act. Um, this was the unions. Unions were formed, but through these same unions, it prohibited African Americans from participating in those unions, from getting the benefit of better wages. So when you look at it, and this, these were not just, you can't just say this was just um, the unions, um, it was a private group. This was done with the knowledge and the blessings of the government. So, you know, the government, as you see here, FHA, the government actually sanctioned all these activities, which had a negative impact on the building of wealth for 
African Americans, and people of color. Um, when you look back at intergenerational wealth, as I said earlier, it's driven by real estate. If you're able to buy a home, stay in that home, over time, you're paying your mortgage, you're, you're building equity, and over time, you're able to pay that off, and you will have something that you can pass on to your descendants, or you can take a loan out to send your kids to college or to pay for medical bills. If you do not have the resources to do that, and you need to send your kids to college, they're going to have to do it on just on pure debt. And that's going to start them off behind the eighth ball. If you're sick and you can't pay for the medical care, you may not get the best medical care or the or adequate medical care. So these, there are all these things that has been done that created and prevented people of color from building wealth. Um, as um, Richard Rothstein just spoke about, you had white flight. So, and that, that took the form of people leaving the cities and moving to the suburbs. But it also had the impact of businesses, companies leaving the, the cities, moving to the suburbs. So while there were opportunities at one point for people of color in the cities to gain employment and to try to build something, now there are no city, there are no jobs available, and so it's not just housing. Now you have the issue where it is affecting employment because they're not able to get the um, the jobs. It led to urban decay. What did that do? And and it's all a system. It's it's one thing building on another. This urban decay allow people to look at it and say, well. That's how they want to live. They like that. But that's not the case. Because people could not afford to pay for the maintenance of these apartments, and also because the owners of these apartments, they did not live there. They were wealthy suburbanites, and they what they did, they just collected the money, and they would pay as little as possible. to, to They would reinvest as little as possible back into those communities. There's another video that um, I'm going to show you. This is about, I'm just going to show about five minutes. And it's another perspective on how the government created this wealth gap. So if you'll bear with me, I hope this will work well. That's not what I want. All right. I don't believe that is going to work. Let's see. So let's, let me continue. All right. So I won't show that one. We'll send that one out so you can watch that. Now, we talk about um, what the government did. And um, there's a video that we're going to send out, and it's called Hiding in Plain Sight. And it's about a wall that was used with the approval of the government to separate two communities. It's just a six-foot wall. But if you lived on one side of the wall, you were able to get the loan to buy a home and live in a very nice neighborhood. If you lived on the other side of the wall, not so much. You would not get that benefit, and you would have to live in dilapidated conditions. So the other process was that, as I mentioned earlier, because of this, the loan approval discrimination led to predatory lease to buy arrangements. Um, and you know, we had the 2007, 2008, 2000 housing crash. And a big part of that was predatory lending. Um, in 2017, home ownership rates were whites had 72.5% home ownership, Hispanics had 46.1%, and blacks had 42%. These are significant disparities. On average, 
black median wealth in the U.S. is 27, 25.7% of the white median wealth, while Hispanic median wealth is 31%, 31.2% of white median wealth. And that's not because people are lazy and don't want to work. For a few people, that is the case. But for the majority of people living in these circumstances, especially in our urban centers, this is because of policies that was implemented by the government. And, you know, as I said that, I just remembered the Tulsa, Oklahoma race riot. And if you watch that video, um, there were communities that had built strong communities, wealthy, thriving communities. These communities were destroyed, and what happened was the bank, the insurance companies refused in most, in many cases, to pay the claims, even though people were paying their premiums. Banks, because these people's homes and their passbooks were burnt up in the fire, they'd go to the bank and they would say, I have an account here, my home burnt down, but I ha you, here's my name, can you give me my money? The banks would refuse to give those people their monies, knowing that their homes are burnt, burnt up. And so here you have a system where wealth was being taken away from people and banks, insurance companies, and many other organizations benefited while others suffered. So where do we go from here? You know, the perception of many whites is that the problem of wealth and income inequality was resolved by the civil, civil rights legislation and affirmative action, affirmative action programs. But if you think through that, you realize that it really didn't. Legislation has been passed, but as I've, as I've said, you can pass the legislation, but if it's not enforced, it does no good. Educational disparities. Are we back to separate but equal? Or are we at separate and unequal? Are we providing the same level of educational opportunities to kids in the urban centers as we're providing to our kids in the suburb? The Great Recession foreclosures substantially increased for many lower income people wiping out real estate wealth. Subprime loans were given to many people when they qualified for better. If you go back and read some of the studies, you'll realize that many people of color, they qualified for regular loans, but they were given a subprime loan where they had to pay higher interest rates. That's another way that, and, and I, I must say that that was not done by necessarily the government, although they could have done more to prevent it. These were done by corporations. So one of the things is, you know, as I was thinking through this, um, where do we go from here? And the word that comes to mind is justice. And I asked myself, what does that look like? How do we do that? And it's really, what is the right thing to do? Blacks are 60% more likely to to be declined for a loan, even given equal credentials, interest rates for non-whites are about a half a point higher than on average. So if we, when you talk about welcome in wealth and income inequality, there are these little factors that all adds up to creating this disparity. Um, and so we have to find ways to fix that. Industrial globalization, illegal immigration, mass incarceration of African Americans. That is a historic and a current issue that's impact black males leading to 
persistent financial disadvantages. How is that? No opportunities. They're, they're, they're taken out of the family. They're sent to jail. And so they're not a part of the home to help to provide an income, to help to build wealth, and to grow that family's income and wealth. In 1865, African Americans held 0.5% of the U.S. wealth. By 1990, that's 135 years later, that number had only increased to 1%. Today, that number is a, a little bit over 2.6%. And when you think about it, the black population makes up over 13, actually, I think, the most recent census said it's about 17% of the U.S. population. In addition, the median income for whites in 2020 was almost 70,000, while the median income for blacks was just about 41,000. Is it because of a lack of qualification? I don't think so. It's not, it's, it's, and it comes back to justice. What is the right thing to do? Why are people who are just as qualified not given the same opportunity and the same benefits? And that's something that we have to look at. And as we, if we really believe in justice, this is something that we need to fix. So when you look at this table here, it shows the, medium income and the average income for Pacific Islanders, Hispanic or Latino, two or more races, American Indians, Asians, black, and white, non-Hispanics. And you can see the differences where there's some groups that are doing well and there are others that are not. And it's not just, it's not a matter that some people are lazy and, and others are not. Some people just don't have the opportunity. So I want you to ponder what you've heard. And I would, I'd like for you to ask yourself the question, um, some questions about these. To what degree did you know that the federal government has been actively involved in redlining? Do you think this continues today and how so? Given what we're learning and what we've learned about Jim Crow and other ethnic and cultural biases that we've discussed, how does the idea of government endorse or institutionalized bias make you feel? How would you feel if you were an African American and had to deal with this on a daily basis? You had to think about it. You had to deal with it. Do you believe that white people have been unduly advantaged? And, you know, on that question, one of the things that I would say, with the, if that is the case, and these opportunities were not provided to African Americans when it was provided to whites, what should be done? What can the government now do to ensure that those opportunities are provided? Something to think about. So did the US government policies constitute institutional racism? What can and should be done to right these wrongs? You know, it's important for us to remember that we are all Americans. We're all citizens of this great country. Um, and it's important that as we do that, we, we make sure that we keep that focus in mind. Um, there's um, the cultural advantage concept here where you have white privilege. And it's a word that's for some people is a trigger word. Um, but it's really a set of unearned rights and opportunities that white people benefit from on a daily basis beyond those common to all others. And, you know, one of the cultural advantage concepts that I want to talk about is where many of you are familiar with George Bernard Shaw. And he has a saying that people are always blaming their circumstances for what they are. He said, I don't believe in circumstances. 
these people who get on, the people who get on in this world are the people who get up and look for the circumstances they want, and if they can't find them, they make them. This is what meritocracy looks like. He sounds like somebody who pulled himself up by his bootstrap, doesn't he? You'd think he had a difficult upbringing and he pulled himself up, but he didn't. He didn't grow up in the, subs, the slums of Dublin. He didn't have to participate in child labor. His father was a business owner and his mother was a music teacher. And while George Bernard Shaw was developing a writing career, he was supported by his mother. Not a lot of people have that opportunity. And when you have that opportunity, it's a privilege. And so, but he, didn't, he doesn't see that as a privilege. He sees that as an opportunity to look down on those who don't have that privilege and tell them how they need to go pull themselves up by their bootstraps when many of them don't even have bootstraps to pull themselves up by. Um, so some of the things that prevented um, the wealth to flow across the U.S. to all, all groups is Jim Crow, land grants, the wealth gap, and the education gap. Um, the income gap is a, still a big problem. Yes, there's a problem with broken family and culture over a prolonged people of, period of time. Yes, there are issues that need to be addressed, but that's, n that's only a part of the problem. The core problem is around the systems that were created to prevent people from building and growing wealth. So mer meritocracy rules says individual is all about individual effort and responsibility, hard work, being competitive, maximizing one's innate ability. But it, did we mention that your parents, status, position, power, privilege, wealth, and network? Those are things that also help to build wealth. And many people of color don't have those networks. So one of the things I want to talk about is where do we go from here? So I want us to begin with a deep personal assessment of how we really see each other or how we see the other. I want, to take, I want us to take inventory of who is in our circle and how diverse it is. What are we hearing? What are we sharing? How are we expanding that circle? How do the people in my circle treat the other? And how do I respond to the way they're treated? After doing this deep personal assessment, do I really believe that all persons are created equal? And do I ensure to the best of my ability and my power that they're all treated equally? Am I willing to be the change and make the positive change that we want to see? Can we do the right thing and seek justice? We need to create and guarantee equality of opportunity for everyone. And just to be clear, I'm not asking that we guarantee equality of outcome, just opportunity. And I'll just use a simple one. Think about our education system. Do we create the same equality of opportunity for our kids, K through 12, to get the same quality education so that they can compete on an equal basis? Let's seek to ensure that the schools available for many students of color, the middle class and the poor are as good as the schools and with the quality of education that's available to the rich. Let's ensure that tax laws in our society are not increasingly weighted to the wealthy 
but are equal across the board. Now I'm gonna, sh um, there's a video I want to share by Brian Stevenson. He's an American lawyer, social justice activist, founder. He's the executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative, and he's a clinical professor at New York University School of Law. He's a Harvard Law School graduate, and he's written the book, Just Mercy. Um, and actually it was, um, it came out as a movie, I think it last two years. And so let's, I spent a lot of time in jails and prisons. I spent a lot of time with people who live in the margins of our society. I spent a lot of time with the poor. And I'm persuaded that there is more we can do to create a healthier environment, a more just society. And I actually think that justice is good for everybody. I think that a healthier environment where no one feels excluded, no one feels ignored, no one feels disfavored is good for everyone. And I don't think we've made the kind of progress that we could make if we did some things differently. Because my work has been in the criminal justice system, I've seen some really tragic developments over the last half century. Many of us have been taught that if there's a bad part of town, oh, don't put your business there. Don't visit that part of town. Stay as far away from that segment of the community as possible. I am persuaded we need to do the opposite. We need to find ways to engage and invest and position ourselves in the places where there is despair. I actually think when we situate ourselves next to people who are excluded and marginalized and disfavored and left out, at a very minimum, we can find collective and institutional and meaningful ways to embrace these communities. And sometimes it is that witness that can be transformative. I started working with children who had been prosecuted as adults and in proximity to these communities, I discovered some things that I couldn't discover absent proximity. I got involved in a case of a 14 year old boy who lived in a household where his mother would sometimes be the target of domestic violence. Uh, this boy's mother uh, had a boyfriend and when that man would start drinking, he'd get violent. And one day the man had been drinking and he came home and he called the boy's mother into the kitchen. She walked into the kitchen and the man went up to her and he just punched her in the face. She fell down, she hit her head as she fell. She was on the floor bleeding and unconscious. Her son came running into the kitchen to help his mom. He tried to revive her, he tried to stop the bleeding. But after 10 minutes, she was still non-responsive and that little boy thought his mom was dead. The man went into a bedroom and he fell asleep. The little boy got up, he walked into the bedroom, he was going to call the police, he was going to call an ambulance, but then he remembered that this man kept a handgun in his dresser drawer. So he walked over to the drawer, he pulled out the gun, he walked over to where the man was sleeping, he pointed the gun at the man's head. The man was snoring, and when the man stopped snoring and jumped, the little boy jumped, and when the little boy jumped, he pulled the trigger and shot the man in the head, killing him instantly. It was very tragic. This little boy was very small for his age, he was under five feet tall, he weighed less than 100 pounds, he'd never been in trouble before. Uh, he was the kind of kid that might have been tried as a juvenile, but for the fact that the man that he shot and killed, his mother's boyfriend, well, that man was a deputy sheriff. And because he was a deputy sheriff, the prosecutor insisted that this child be tried as an adult. And the judge certified him to stand trial as an adult, and they immediately placed him in the adult jail. He'd been there three days before I got involved in the case, and I went to the jail to see this little boy. And when he walked in, I was stunned by how terrified he looked. He sat down and I, I began asking him questions, but no matter what I asked him, he wouldn't say anything, he just sat there. I finally put my pen down and I said, look, I can't help you if you don't talk to me, you gotta talk to me. Little boy wouldn't say anything, he just continued sitting there. He was staring at the wall, not saying a word. I got up and I moved my chair close to him and I, and I just tried to get him to talk. I said, come on, you gotta talk to me, and he wouldn't say anything. I couldn't figure out what to do, and at some point, I just leaned on him. I don't even know why, but I leaned on him. And when I leaned on him, he leaned back. And when he leaned back, I put my arm around him and I said, come on, you gotta talk to me. I can't help you if you don't talk to me. And that's when this little boy started to cry. And through his tears, he began talking to me, not about what happened with the man, not about what happened with his mom, but he started talking to me about what had happened at the jail. He told me on the first night, several men had hurt him. He told me on the next night, he'd been sexually assaulted by several people. He told me on the night before I'd gotten there, so many people had hurt him, he couldn't remember how many there had been. And I held this little boy while he cried hysterically for almost an hour. 
I finally got him calm. I said, look, I'm going to get you out of here. You stay right here. And I will never forget trying to leave that jail. And that little boy grabbed me by the arm and he said, please, please don't go. Please don't go. I said, no, it's okay. It's all right. I'm going to get you out of here. And when I left the jail, the question I had in my mind is, who is responsible for this? And the answer is, we are. We've allowed this distance to be created from some of the most vulnerable people in our society. On any given day in this country, there are 10,000 children being housed in adult jails and prisons where they're at great risk. We've allowed narratives to emerge that separate us from some of these children. And I believe proximity is the solution because you in that space would react just like I did. I'm the product of someone's choice to get proximate. I don't talk about proximity just from an intellectual perspective. I grew up in a community where black children could not go to the public schools. When I was a little boy, I had to go to the colored school. They didn't let black kids go to the public schools. When my dad was a teenager, there were no high schools for black children in our county. And then lawyers came into the community and made them open up the public schools. They enforced Brown versus Board of Education because those lawyers chose to get proximate to poor black kids like me, I got to go to high school. I have no illusions about the fact that I would not be standing here if those lawyers hadn't gotten proximate to poor black kids like me. But because they did, I got to go to high school. I got to go to college. Nobody in my family had gone to college. When I got to college, it was like entering this world I didn't know existed. I loved college. I got proximate. I started working with lawyers that represented people on death row. I started working with children who had been prosecuted as adults and in proximity to these communities, I discovered some things that I couldn't discover absent proximity. I think ultimately what we do to get proximate to those who are disfavored and excluded, what we do to change narratives, what we do to stay hopeful, what we do that is inconvenient and uncomfortable can sometimes be the most meaningful thing we do. It is how we honor what it means to have responsibility to have opportunity, to have privilege. I believe really simple things. I believe that each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. And that's the reason why I represent the condemned, the incarcerated. I believe if someone tells a lie, they're not just a liar. If someone takes something, they're not just a thief. And that justice requires we know the other things they are. I am persuaded that the opposite of poverty is not wealth. Sometimes I think we talk too much about money. I am persuaded that the opposite of poverty isn't wealth. I believe the opposite of poverty is justice. And when we do justice, we deconstruct the conditions that give rise to poverty. I actually think we're going to be judged not by how we treat the wealthy and the privileged. I think we're going to be judged by how we treat the poor, the excluded, and the neglected. And in that context, there's something meaningful and rich waiting for us. That was Brian Stevenson talking about getting proximate. It means getting outside of our comfort zone, getting to those people who are different from us, who need our help, who we can make a difference in their lives. Change the narrative. There's a narrative about people of color that is, sees us as less than, as the other. How do we change that narrative? How do we make sure that those around us aren't using that negative narrative and the stereotypes that are there? Create a sense of hope, because without hope, it's so important to remain hopeful. If we can keep people hopeful, then we can help them to go to the next level and do the uncomfortable. Talking about race, dealing with these things, it's not comfortable for anyone. But when we do it, we'll help to make a difference and to help make our world a better place. Now... I'm going to turn it over to Carol in a minute. And this is not the end, even though this was our final presentation in this five-part series. I want you to think about how you can share and give back to others what you've learned through these presentations. How can you develop habits that will lead to becoming a racial reconciler? How can you continue to educate yourself and stay informed? How can and will you use your privilege to help those with little or no privilege? Many of us have privilege. I even have some privilege. But there are many people who have a lot more privilege than I do. How can we all use our privilege to help those who have little or no privilege? How will you become more engaged in the process of justice and racial reconciliation? As you think about this, what will be your next action step? And as Brian said, 
Remember, the opposite of poverty is not necessarily wealth. It's justice. We all need that. So Martin Luther King said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And justice is awareness. It's about relationships. And it's about commitment. So I'm going to have Carol come now. And she's, she'll continue to talk about where do we go from here. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Lloyd. That was good. So Lloyd has given us a lot, a lot to digest. Um, I, I love your emphasis always on hope and the future. And the word that I have taken from this that I'm going to really hang on to going forward is proximate, proximity. Um, that's a really powerful word with all that it means. And Lloyd gave us so much to ponder and gave us a call to action. And I can see how you might be, I am overwhelmed. Like how in the world could I possibly make a difference? Where in the world should I start? And Lloyd mentioned all of these terms, awareness, education, conversation, and activism. You know, when you roll up your sleeves and get to work with people who have a different background or different opinions than you. Everyone benefits. We all want the same thing. We want a bright future for successive generations. We want a town where we can build a safe, healthy, productive life, where we have choices, where we can realize a life with dignity. So what should we do? The good news is that the work has already started in Simsbury. People are already working on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And your opinion matters. We need you at the table. So I'm going to walk you through a few committees that you might consider volunteering for. There's the events committee. Let's Talk is a monthly panel discussion co-sponsored by the Simsbury Public Library, um, as this series is. And it's on Zoom still. Um, and every month, there's a huge variety of topics over the course of the year. And each month, local voices and experts are brought together in a panel discussion with a Zoom audience and interact with them. Um, I just would like to put a plug in for Tomorrow night, Let's Talk is going to be amazing. Quickly register with the library so you can get the Zoom link. Um, our guests are um, unbelievable. And the topic will be women and girls, equity versus equality. So understanding the difference between the two. Um, and we're looking forward to a spring where we can plan events and gather in outdoor spaces um, so if you join as a volunteer, you could help plan and execute those events. We also have the Housing Committee. Um, the Housing Committee in, has been investigating housing plans of suburban towns who are already engaged in pursuing equity um, that affordable housing promotes. They're working to prioritize the $10,000 grant that they got from the Hartford Foundation. How can that best be used? Um, the, one of the main things that's being discussed and worked on is trying to figure out how to draw more town citizens in to this conversation, how to get more people involved. And it's really critical to understand housing can be like a, um, a trigger uh, for some people. Don't decide what this is about. In fact, this committee really, really wants diversity of opinion. They want all 
the points of view in the town of Simsbury represented in the conversation. So please do consider this one. And then the outreach committee, kind of obvious what that is, but if you were to volunteer with them, you would be meeting with organizations in town, clubs, um, and familiarize them with the work that's being done and to encourage them to get on board. We've mentioned at every point, and Lloyd referred to it again, is that we are very interested in having this series prompt or promote discussions. So for you to decide what types of things would you like to discuss with other people that we did not discuss or that we did that you want to go further on. So what do you want to talk about? And what do you want to learn more about? Let us know. So in the live chat, um, there is a feedback form, which we'd be very interested in having you fill out. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about uh, volunteering in any of these, uh, on any of these committees, um, you can go to the Spirit Council Facebook page and leave a message there and somebody will get back to you. Um, Lloyd and I have really enjoyed doing this. Um, we hope that those of you who have watched will tell other people and then you can watch SCTV um, to see some of the earlier uh, ones in the series. Um, but we want from the bottom of our heart to thank you. Thank you, Nicole and Cheryl, co-chairs of the Spirit Council, SCTV. You're, you're just unbelievable. Thank you so much because we reach such a much wider audience. Um, and everybody, take care. Good night. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.